How's everyone this morning? Good. It's good to see you all. It's a beautiful, beautiful day. If you will, I'm going to be in, I'm going to start off in Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 25. I'm going to read those and we'll get started. So Galatians 5, starting in verse 19. It says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I love you and I just praise you and I thank you, Lord, for your beautiful word. And I pray that you just help me this morning, help me along uh, to just share these, share this word with these, uh, with everyone in here this morning, Lord, and I pray that you be with everybody in here and for the remainder of this service, Lord. We love you and we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. All right. So uh, last week I was, I spoke on bearing the fruit of the spirit, how we can, uh, how we can bear the fruit of the spirit, right? How it starts with the heart, a transformation heart. That's where that stuff starts, and. Uh, and so I'm going to keep going with that this week. Uh, I was just going to talk about love today. I was going to start going through these fruits, and I was going to talk about love, but there's something else I wanted to talk about before I got into that. And uh, and, and I'm going to get there here in a minute. But Paul's speaking to these Christians here in Galatians. If, if you go to uh, chapter 1, if you go over to chapter 1, he's preaching to these people because he's writing them this letter because they've, he he come to them preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he and he tells them over there that there's some people that have crept in and they're preaching this false gospel now. He's saying it's not really a gospel; they're preaching this other gospel of what they're doing. They're preaching a false Christ. They're uh, leading these people astray, and he's astonished because he's like, he's like, how it's crazy how quickly you've left the gospel that I've taught you. And he, and he had these people coming in, and they're, I guess they're the. Uh, people who were rooted down in Judaism and stuff like that, and they're bringing, they're trying to tell them that they had to keep following these laws and stuff. And Paul's coming against them saying, no, you're free in Christ. And he's trying to, he's re-explaining to them the gospel and who they are in Jesus Christ. And it's a, uh, it's very fitting as he comes here and he's teaching them how to, how to recognize the flesh, but how to live by the spirit, the fruits that come from the spirit of God. And that's why he categorizes on the way he does. He calls one uh, the works of the flesh. The other one is the fruit of the spirit. You know, in my flesh, I produce all these things that he talks about here in verses 19, 20, and 21. But as I give my heart to Jesus Christ, I begin to produce, the, not me produce, but the spirit in my life as I grow in Christ starts to produce these other things, right? The love, the joy, the peace. Those things come from a person who's been saved. And you know, this is one of the things I wanted to get to this morning. Uh, and I talked about it some last week, how at the moment you get saved, you receive the Spirit of God. Now there's teachings out there in, in Christianity and mainstream Christianity that people claim that you have to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Like it's something that's separate from salvation. And that's just, and it's, this isn't true. And these are things that I've, uh, that coming up even as a young Christian, I've been a part of these types. Of, I've seen people teach it in church. It's it, A lot of charismatic and Pentecostal church teaches this doctrine. And some people believe it. And I just wanted to knock out the notion this morning of it to show people, look, when you get saved, you possess the spirit of God. You do. And and where people go wrong is they take a couple by a couple verses of the Bible out of context. And I'm going to show you this morning what uh, the fact that we have the Spirit of God in us at conversion. It's not something that we have to... We don't get saved and then get baptized with the Holy Spirit later on. Whenever you get saved, you receive Holy Spirit right then and there. It's instantaneous. A Christian without the Spirit of God would be a dead Christian. The Spirit is life. He is your, he is your spiritual life. 
And uh, what people do is they take over in Mark 1 8, John the Baptist says this when he sees Jesus. He says, Indeed, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Over in Matthew 3 11, he's, Matthew looks at it like this. He says, Indeed, or I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now this is John speaking of the come of when Jesus Christ comes on the scene. He's saying, "Look, I'm just baptizing you with water for repentance, but there's this one coming. He's gonna he's gonna transform everything. He's gonna baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire." And uh, and we see uh, throughout Jesus's ministry, right? He he's out preaching, he's doing things, but his uh, but it wasn't until he died that he actually sent the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until then that he actually sent the Holy Spirit on people. In Acts 1, 4, and 5, this is a, um, it says this. It says, and being assembled together with him, this is Jesus. This is Jesus. He's, he's, he's already died. He's resurrected, but he's out. He, he comes to this upper room where these people are gathered. And listen to what he tells them. He says, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. It, he's right there. He's re-quoting what John told his what John told his followers. Right, that look, I baptize you with water, but when Jesus comes, he's going to baptize you with the Spirit. And this is Jesus talking here in Acts, telling them, look, he's saying, he's saying, stay here, wait. John baptized with water. But here, here, here soon, I'm gonna, many days from now, I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, over in Acts, if we go to Acts 2, we'll start there. We're going to see whenever this baptism happens. All right? I'm going to start uh, Acts 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. And it says, When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each on each one of them. And they were all, listen, filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now, right here is where people have this notion that, and people truly believe this, that when I get saved, that, that it's not until I speak in tongues that that's proof of the Holy Spirit. People will tell you that, but that's a lie. And I'm going to show you why right here. Look, he, he says, uh, and yes, when the Holy Spirit filled this room, look, they did speak with other tongues. But the word tongues there isn't like a whole, blah, 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 just this craziness that goes on. That's not what it is. These guys were speaking in an unlearned language. It would be like if this room was full of... Uh, Hispanics, Chinese, Japanese, an American, uh, some Creole dude over here that speaks Creole, right? And we all st and like I started speaking Chinese and never never knew how to speak it. This guy over here speaking English. That's what was happening in this room. They were speaking an unlearned language. It was a it was a common language, but it was one unlearned to them. And, and it tells us that down here in the verse. It says, Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered because they were each one hearing them speak in his own language. See, they were speaking a regular language. It wasn't this crazy gibberish that you see people do. Right? That's not what was happening. That they're speaking this language. The Holy Spirit fell on these people just as Jesus was saying. And first... Look, it's come to these Jews. And then if we move over to uh, if, if, if you move over to Acts chapter 10 because this is the verses that this is where people will use these verses to say that that uh, that until you're baptized in the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit comes upon you that you'll speak in tongues. But look, this is the beginning of the church. That's what's happening here. He's showing, look, now the Holy Spirit has come down. Jesus has ascended into heaven. His Holy Spirit is poured out on all mankind. First to the Jews, right here. And then if you go over to Acts 10, you're going to see the same thing happen with the Gentiles. And this is, uh, he sends Peter to them. And first, uh, Peter has a dream, right? 
He has this dream of these unclean things and uh, this blanket comes down and God's telling Peter, he says, look, don't call something unclean that I've made clean. And, uh, and so in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 through 48, I'm going to read these. He says, in opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. And he's showing like, look, Jesus came for everybody, the Jews and the Gentiles. This Holy Spirit, he's fallen on the Jews now, and here he comes to the Gentiles. It says, but in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we were witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, and they also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should uh, become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen before him by God. That is, to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that, that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. And all, and all the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also. That's This is the same thing that was happening to the Jewish people in chapter 2. This is the same thing he's saying, look, the Holy Spirit has fallen upon all mankind, and that's where the unity of the body of Christ is. Is that we, when we come to faith in Christ, we are all partakers of the same Spirit. It's not something extra, extra, extra to salvation. That I'm, look, if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're, you're life. You're dead. That's how God revives you. He saves you and gives you His Spirit to breathe. To, that's what brings you alive. That's what makes you a new creation. Is the Spirit of God. That's how you bear the fruits of the Spirit. How would you be fruitful if you didn't have the Spirit? If it was something extra you had to have, you could. It's impossible. And I'm going to show you some other verses over in First Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. It says, "For by one Spirit, listen, we were all baptized into one body." Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. We're all of that same spirit. That's what brings us together as, a, as Christians, is the, is the spirit of God. That's what makes us a body. Because that's the life of the body, is the spirit. <clears throat> Romans 8 9 says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Listen, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you're not a Christian. That's what he's telling you right there. If you do not have the Spirit of God in you, you're not a Christian. And Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. He tells you right there, right at salvation, you receive the spirit of God. He's a down payment. He's the guarantee of who you are as a Christian living within you. And, uh, and, and you know, over in John, and I talked about last week about being, uh, being a branch tied to that vine, right? It's only natural that when you get saved, and you come tethered to the vine of Christ. What flows through the vine has to flow through the branch or you're a dead branch. It has to. The roots in the trunk of the tree give life to the branches. You, can, you can't be a fruitful, I guess you could say, branch connected to the vine of Christ without what flows through him flowing through you. And, uh, and, it, and you know, and I, and I say that to... To, to say this now there is Christians who don't don't walk according to the spirit I guess you could say but it doesn't mean that they don't have the spirit of God within them that's why 1 Thessalonians 5 19 says it says do not quench the spirit 
is something that we can quench. We can, uh, I guess you could say, stop up the flow of the spirit. Like my brother-in-law says it. He says it's kind of like a uh, kink in a water hose is what people do. Whenever we don't yield ourselves to Jesus Christ, when we don't yield ourselves to the leading of the spirit of God, walking by our convictions, it's kind of like kink in a water hose. And that's, and that's what some people do. They quench, they, quench, they quench the Spirit. And Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. He says, don't grieve me. You know, when we live, I think about that, when we live in sin or when we, uh, um, I guess, deny our convictions, you know, when it, whenever we make up our mind, like, I'm going to do this, no matter what, no matter how, even though we know in our hearts the spirit of God's convicting of us, and we do it anyways. To me, that's that's grieving the spirit of God. And Ephesians five seventeen and eighteen says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit of God. You know, the great thing uh, when I thought about this, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit, how God fills us with the Holy Spirit, right? But if have you ever seen a, uh, I, I, like I said, I like to watch a lot of YouTube videos, but you ever see these people in these church services going crazy? They'll be shaking, flopping like a crappie on the bottom of a boat all over the place. And they're like, the, the, the Holy Spirit just took over me, right? I couldn't even control myself. What's one of the fruit of the Spirit? Self-control. There's, no there's no one on earth more self-controlled or should be more self-controlled than a Christian. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't possess you, it fills you. Demons possess people and take over people. The Holy Spirit of God fills a person. God's a gentleman. He's not going to make you do anything. And, I, and you know, I think about that when people say that. Oh, I just couldn't control myself. The Spirit just had these people flopping. No, the Bible talks about, you know, things are done orderly and right within church not crazy and disorderly. And, and a Christian is a self-controlled person. You can control yourself as a Christian. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit, is self-control. And, uh, and, uh, and just moving on, so, so, so we're all filled with the Holy Spirit of God and we're all to bear the fruit of that Spirit. And, uh, and you know what, the, the fruit that we bear, it just, it shows what kind of tree we are. It shows who we are. It shows who, and it, uh, and and when I was thinking about fruit, you know, fruit benefits those. It benefits other people. It don't necessarily benefit the tree, like, uh, like an apple tree. You know, yeah, it just naturally bears fruit, but it's but but the fruit it, it shows us what kind of tree it is, and it benefits those who pick the fruit thereof or who experience the fruit thereof, and uh. And it's the same with the Christian. While, yeah, the fruit of the Spirit, it affects us too. It's something we all want in our lives, right? Love, joy, peace. We all want those things. Um, and and that's why I think it's fitting that Paul starts off there in verse uh, there in verse 22. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. He starts off with love. You know, love is one of the biggest marks of a Christian. Love is. And it's saying the Spirit of God produces this love in your life. And to understand, uh, and to understand, you know, the, the thing is, though, the world has these misconceptions of what love is. That they do. There's a lot of misconceptions of what love is. What the world tells you is that it's a, it's a feeling, right? It's based on feelings and desires and things like that. But that's not at all what the love that he's talking about here. The love here is the agape love of God. It's that unconditional um, it, it's a choice type of love. I, I make the choice, right, to love like this. And But it's the Holy Spirit that when I got saved, this Holy Spirit God put in me, He gives me the desire, right, to have this love. He gives me the desire to have this love and to produce this love in my life as I yield to Him, as I'm obedient to the Word of God, right? And uh, and so there's uh, there's four different kinds of love in the New Testament. There's a there's this Euros love, and it's it's where you get the it's where we get our English term for erotic or, and stuff like that. It's like a, it's more of a sexual type of love. There's a phileo love, which is brotherly love, which is brotherly love or friendly love. 
then there's a uh, this it's called store hay love or storgy i don't know really how to say it but it's natural affection kind of like that of a parent child relationship and like i said but the love that we're talking about here is agape love and if you don't have a agape, and you got to understand agape love is what it affects all these other types of love it's like it's the main love it's the love that god has for us and for a perfect definition of it i'm going to read first corinthians chapter 13 because it is the definition of what agape love is and it says this and and it says this if i speak with the tongues of men and of angels and do not have love i have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal and if i have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries all faith so as to remove mountains but do not love i am nothing and if i give all my possessions to feed the poor and if i deliver my body to be burned but do not have love it profits me nothing Listen to this. This is the love that he's talking about from the Spirit. He says, love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy... They will be done away if there are tongues they will cease if there is knowledge it will be done away for we know in part and we prophesy in part but when the perfect comes the the partial will be done away when i was a child i used to speak as a child think as a child reason as a child when i became a man i did away with childish things for now we see in the mirror dimly but then face to face now i know in part but then i shall know fully just as i also have been fully known but now by faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And listen to verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. I like how he says that right there starting on 14. Pursue love. As Christians, we are to pursue love. We are. We, we pursue the love of God. And, and as we do that, as we yield to the Spirit of God, we produce this same type of love. And, uh, and all of us want that kind of love, a patient, love, kind, not jealous. It doesn't brag. It's not arrogant, right? We all want that kind of love. We all want to experience that kind of love. And uh, Romans 5.5 5 says, Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. It's saying this love that God has for us, it's been poured out into our hearts. This agape love by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. He's poured out. It's the same love that saved us that we see over in uh, John 3, 16, where God says, for God so loved the world. That's God's choice love. And I'm thankful that God chose to love us like that because, you know, agape love doesn't, it, it's not a type of love that holds, uh, as it said over here in uh, 1 Corinthians, that holds wrongs towards people, right? It's not impartial. It's not a, a it's, it loves all people. No matter what they've done to you, no matter how they hurt you or anything. That's the type of love we're to be producing as Christians. And uh, uh, 1 John 3.16 says, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And, and that's the kind of love we're to have for people. And, you know, love doesn't condemn. Uh, and, and when I thought about this, you know, love is a security thing. I think about this in marriage. You know, my wife, I, I thought about this with my marriage. Why, how does my wife know that I would never just up and leave her? And, it's in, in, uh, and her answer can't just be, oh, because he, he loves Jesus, right? That, that couldn't be her answer because... Uh, people who say they love Jesus, they leave their wives all the time. But one thing I know that she can say is she knows I love her. And how does she know I love her? Because I treat her like I love her. I show her that I love her. Just the same way God does to us. He showed us that we loved us by the fact that he laid his life down. He laid his son down for us for our salvation. And it's the same thing as a husband. You know, I, I lay myself, I'll lay my life down for my wife. And she knows that I love her. 
and I love her to death. I love you. But but that's you know it's a security thing. And that's what my wife, when she thinks about me or knows it, she knows like my husband loves me, that's why he would be. He loves me like he loves me the way he's supposed to. Like Christ loved the church. And I'm not perfect by any means, but I try to I I try to love my wife all the time. It's very hard. It's a choice. I mean, that's the thing about agape love. It's a choice love. It's not based on feelings. You know, if my wife uh, loved me based on her feelings, we'd have a bad marriage. <laughs> we would be. All of us would, though. You know what I mean? If my love fluctuated with how I felt, I don't even know if my marriage would definitely would last. We'd get a divorce. I mean, if, if it went off feelings. Because I don't always feel like loving my wife. I don't. And that's the great thing about agape love, the love we're supposed to produce as, uh, as Christians. And over in Matthew chapter 5, I want to read this, uh, verses 43 through 48, it says this. He says, you have heard, this is Jesus speaking. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now listen to Jesus. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now that's a hard command. To love your enemies, to choose to love these people who hate you, who persecute you, who treat you wrong, in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he calls us his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Listen to verse 48. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, I thought about that and I thought, how am I going to be perfect? Because I'm very imperfect. I am. We all are. I mean, the Bible tells us we're all sinners. We all need forgiveness. Even after we're saved, we got we still live a life of repentance, right? So how am I to be perfect like God is? He's not talking about being perfect in, uh, I guess you could say, your conduct or something. He's saying be perfect in love. He's saying the way I love, you love like that. And if you'll do that, that's how you're perfect as the Father is. Look at the context. That's what he's talking about is loving people. The context shows you what he's talking about. And, and that's why he says there in uh, verse 45, um, he says, for he calls us his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He's saying, I, he's saying everything I get, like my, he uses nature, of course, right? He's saying the sun don't just rise on the good folks. It rises on the bad folks, too. The rain, it benefits everybody. And that's the way our love is supposed to be. It should be expressed to everyone. Those bad, uh, the bad, the ugly, and the good. And uh, and John thirteen thirty five says, "A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you love, if you have love for one another. You know, that's, love is the biggest mark of a believer. That you know, if people come in here and they feel, and they feel the love of God." You know, if we're all yielding to the Spirit of God and we got love, joy, peace, and people come in and see that, that's attractive to people. People love that. Everyone wants to feel loved. And when they see how you interact with each other, that's a testimony of Jesus Christ. And that's where all these fruits are. That They testify of who you are. They show who you are as a Christian. They reveal the obedience that you have to Christ. The fact that you yield your life to Jesus Christ. Yield your life to the Spirit of God. And that's how we'll bear these fruits as we yield, as we yield to the Spirit of God in our lives, to and to the conviction of the Spirit and walk by the Spirit, like the Bible, like it says over there in Galatians. You know, if we're, uh, he said, let me just go over there, verse twenty-five over here in Galatians. He says, if we live by the Spirit, if that's what we live by, he said, let us also walk by the Spirit. And that's what we need to do as Christians. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. And if we'll do that, we'll produce the love, the joy, the peace, all those things. We'll have them all. But the greatest is love. Don't ever forget that. If you ain't got love, you ain't going to have the others. Love is the greatest. 
And that's why the Bible puts such a big emphasis on love. And it's the Spirit of God that produces that love in us, that helps us love like the Lord did. And dear Heavenly Father, I love you and I just praise you, Lord. And I just pray, Father, that that we all understand, Lord, that when we give our hearts to you, that we all have your Holy Spirit within us, Lord God. That we don't have to do anything. There's nothing extra that has to be done for us to receive your Spirit. But the Bible tells us that when we get saved, that you put your Holy Spirit, you fill us with the Spirit of God. And I pray, Lord, that as we go about, Lord, as we uh, are living our daily lives, Lord, that we don't point your spirit, that we don't grieve the spirit of God, Father God, but that we that we allow your spirit to flow freely and fully through our lives, and that we just uh, and that we allow him to produce these fruits in our lives as we yield to him, Father. And, um, I pray that you watch over everyone in here, keep them safe, and I just pray that you bless each and everybody in this morning, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray.